I think that's excellent from Hugo. Um, Hugo's just to, to pick out the points uh, that he, that he made here supports certification a and standards, but in a in a cautious and sensible way, really. Good. Um, we have uh, people uh, who are emailing in questions. We have about uh, up to an hour, I think, for uh, discussion from the floor. And so I'm going to take some questions now um, from anything you want to raise, any clarifications, questions to the presenters or, or the panellists or even to each other. Uh, please go ahead. Please raise your arms, hands, and Carrie and Leah will pass you a microphone. Morris, please go ahead. Can you say who you are, Morris? Uh, I'm Morris. I'm yes. Morris, <laughs> <laughs> Morris Hurston, currently uh, one of the editors of Forced Migration Review. Um, and I, I've sort of been on the fringes of the humanitarian sector for a little while, which is, mm. uh, may or may not help me in, in sitting mm. here listening to this, because um, I don't want to sound like the person who says, oh, do you know what, we've done this before. But actually, I've heard an awful lot of what I've heard before here today. And that's... You know, things don't get solved in one go. We all know that. So maybe that needs doing. But I didn't hear enough that was different either to satisfy me as a sort of semi-external observer nowadays. And that worries me. And I also observed, I think, that um, there were bits of the discussion that I remember that were missing. Mm -hmm. And with a one exception... Um, there was very little reference to external drivers of any of this. So this was all very internally <laughs> driven. As I, and maybe because I sit outside a lot of this stuff, or on the edges of it nowadays, I'm more aware of that than I used to be. And there was also, again, with just a part, without the exception of a passing reference, no reference to other people's standards and accreditation systems and so on. And I remember some years ago, there was quite a bit of investigation about, oh, I don't know, what does the mining industry do? How do they, you know, manage themselves in the way? Because we don't need to learn things from the beginning. There's an awful lot of experience out there. And the last thing is the thing that I think came out most strongly in what Hugo said, which is that this seemed to be all about organisations and not about people, with the exception of what Hugo said. I mean... If you bring new people into organisations, as you do constantly, where does that leave the response? You know, you've then got another layer of difficulty to deal with in making your, your meeting your standards because it's, the organisation has to guarantee that the people that work for it can meet those standards. <coughs> and I don't know, doctors move from one hospital to another. It's the doctor who's accredited or certified or whatever the word, the appropriate word is. I didn't hear any of that either. Anyway. Uh, that's all my buts, and I mm. apologise. Morris, thank you very much. Um, so Morris has heard much of this before. And going back to my earlier question, are you surprised that, that it's coming back, or not surprised? Just worried? Uh, observing. Observing. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> I'm, I'm, on I the guess, fence. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised, John. I'm okay. surprised I heard so little that was new, okay. rather than that I'm hearing okay. some of the same things again. Thank you. Please, at the back. Can you just can you just say say that again into the microphone? Otherwise, I'm Adelaine Williams. Thank Williams. you. I'm a researcher from De Montfort University, um, and I guess I'm building on what Morris said is about learning from different sectors. And it seems like the NGO <coughs> sector is going through something very similar to how what the social work sector in the UK went through a few years back, um, which led to a dramatic over bureaucratisation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know our work, Amnat's done some work yeah. on complexity. Um, theory, etc. But the social work yeah. sector in the UK is very keen on the idea of a systemic approach. So yeah. rather than being systematic, yeah. rather than it being just about completing the forms, getting the certification, meeting the standards, yeah. it's about looking at a systemic approach, looking at the yeah. whole sector and how it works, the power, challenges, dynamics between. Yeah. So a lot of what was mentioned today about whose knowledge counts, you know, yeah. are the beneficiaries really going to feed in this genuinely, how do we educate field practitioners, etc. These are issues that have been raised in the social work sector and I was wondering how that can be built on within this. That's a, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. Maybe Philip might 
pick, pick up on that later because I, I, you said that you were doing some research. I don't know whether you were looking at other sectors, but yeah. we, we'll hear from that later. Anybody else? Brendan, please, can you say uh, who you are? Brendan you. Gormley, um, currently CDAC Network, uh, communicating with disaster-affected communities. Um, obviously really challenged and pleased to hear the, as it were, rebalancing and making sure that the uh, survivors and their leaders are right at the heart of everything. But I didn't really hear what that meant. What it has historically meant is put it in the accountability box and, and have a telephone number so I'd be interested to know what actually is coming out of that that will make for rebalancing. And my second thought is, what is special for the sort of under the humanitarian label? Is it the 10 principles? Because what I'm hearing is we're all saying that we're specializing. So we have nutritionists, doctors, Watson, business development, all of those disciplines have their standards and their training. So what are we looking at to put into the joint overarching humanitarian box? Or are we just saying we need properly trained people? And then what does JSI cover that is specific to the sort of humanitarian, uh, that goes with the humanitarian label? Brendan, thank you. I'll take one more question. Wendy, please. Wait, wait for the microphone, Wendy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy Fenton mm -hmm. from the Humanitarian Practice Network. Um, I'm, I'm interested really in the relationship between the move towards certification and amalgamating or, or a more coherent uh, standards uh, architecture and humanitarian leadership. And I don't know, maybe John, you yourself, as well as the other panelists might want to comment on this. If I remember, I think in the initial leadership study, you know, this issue around the, the bureaucracy and the, the focus on standards and accountability mechanisms meant that um, had seemed to have a detrimental impact on the quality sometimes of humanitarian programming because people are so concerned with focusing on those standards and meeting them that you, you don't see the, you know, the forest for the trees, basically. And, you know, there hasn't really been... I don't know if we've really demonstrated the relationship between meeting those standards and improving the quality of responses. And I'd say also that the, the other issue that concerns me is mm. wha whether we're looking at the relationships between people, not just the education side, making sure people are aware of the standards and, and know how to use them and implement them, but mm. how people work with each other mm. and respond to each other. Um, and although some of that is contained in the code of conduct and in the principles, mm. you know, I'm not mm. hearing so much mm. about that and how that's incorporated. Mm. Thanks. Wendy, that's great. Thank you. You know, we have about, uh, I think we uh, have at least a, a over 100 people who are registered on the live stream uh, today. And we're getting questions coming in. I'm just going to pick up two of them. Uh, they're the first two that came in because they do uh, reflect points that have already been made. And the first one's from a gentleman called Juan Sainz, who is a uh, director of a film company in Mexico City, Humanitarian Productions, and he co-authored Spheres Learning Material and Hat Learning Materials. And he's asking about education, which is the, um, the thing that Hugo mentioned, about um, how... Uh, uh, organizations and projects and people measure their success and what will be the most effective way of learning about benchmarks and who could become the most important group for this learning in the future, host government, the private sector or affected populations. And the second question is from Sylvie Robert, uh, who's an independent consultant. And she says, look, after 20 years uh, after Rwanda, this shows very little change in some areas. It's kind of slightly picking up on what Morris is saying. Can we still believe in a potential shift of power beneficiary-centred, which really picks up Brendan's point, and I think it also refers to, to Sandrine's point. Is that just pie in the sky? So we have lots of questions. Um, I, I think I'm going to look this way, first of all, um, if I may, towards... Philip and um, Matthew, perhaps you'd like to pick up on um, some of the points that were made. Uh, 
Okay, um, if I start off perhaps um, with Morris, um, because Morris and I have obviously worked together for part of that 20 years. <laughs> and I think part of, part of the reason for, for JSI coming together was very much that sense of something had to change. Um, it, was, it was no longer a, a possibility just to continue where we were going. The interesting thing um, that, that, that came out of the research, there was a presumption, if you read the original terms of reference for JSI, it was around proliferation, and that was tended, that was what the sense of the the, the crux or the real problem was about. Um, and and but as soon as we went into the global consultation, um, that that quickly was dispelled. Even though we we done the piece of desk research saying that there were a hundred different standards. I mean, uh, bearing in mind there are, there are, there are different levels of those standards and what they focus on. <laughs> But the overwhelming thing that came out, well, firstly, obviously, that um, people were, were more aware of what Sphere was about. There was no question of that. Um, and and the, the, the larger number of recipients, uh, uh, participants, were, were those who, who were aware of Sphere. The, the second core thing that came out was um, a real question that's been picked up on by some of the questions around um, use of standards. So there was still a lack of data, um, um, and there is still a lack of data available around what change standards actually bring in practice. So I think that's something we have to be aware of, particularly as we move forward um, in, in development of the core standard. But the overwhelming thing that came out was around the issue of harmonization, and that came out right across the board of, of people who fed back into all the surveys, was this, this, this as we read it, a frustration around the, the, the numbers of things that are out there, but more importantly, why don't we come together and work more closely? And that could bring about um, the greatest change. Um, the, the, and that picking up another question around communities at the center, I think, um, again, it was, it was something that came out of the JSI process, but really strongly about engagement with um, disaster-affected communities very loudly, and it's something you know, taking off my JSI hat and putting on my HAP, um, um, hat as chair of HAP and board member, um, it's, it's been critical and remains central to what HAP has always been about. It was also interesting enough, the thing that um, frustrated the HAP board um, most through the process, and we've got a very strong um, southern representation, representation on the HAP board, and this constant cry is, the system is changing, it's not about um, it won't change, it's, it will change, and this growing strength of voice coming from the South. So I think for those of us who sit here with a sense it's going to continue as usual, they're, they're missing the, the key point that's coming out at the moment, that actually it is changing, and it's not looking backwards, we have to look forwards. And a lot of the work that Randolph Kent is doing is, I think, really at the cutting edge in terms of we have to be looking forward, that there is massive change afoot. Um, and it's not about harping back to as it used to be and trying to reclaim that space. Um, and that is a major and strong voice. So, uh, so um, Southern voice is changing, Southern capacities are changing, and we are all aware of that. So that came across um, um, uh, strongly. On the issue of certification uh, and, uh, and bureaucracy, um, I still, having been in the sector for 20 years, find it unbelievable that we are by and large, um, and this again is with my hat, not talking with JSI, but we are um, an unregulated sector. Um, um, CAFOD um, is a certified member of HAP, and we believe there needs to be some form of moving towards um, certification. But moving to JSI, I think the really exciting thing is around how JSI is seen, is bringing together the three organisations in creating this core standard um, and creating an architecture, which in answer to sort of Hugo's point, puts um, principles right at the centre. So it's about simplicity that we have to move ahead on. Principles at the centre, the core standard around that, and then technical standards around that. So it's nothing um, amazingly clever, it's something that's really simple that would be the success of moving forward on drawing together what the core standard will actually look like. Matthew, can I j just come back on one one point there, if I may, on behalf of, sorry, um, the person that spoke uh, earlier, yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't remember your name, Kate Willis. Kate Willis, was surprised right at the beginning of this that there <coughs> seems to be over a hundred standards or quality and accountability initiatives and so on, and it seems to me from listening to your answer that 
part of the rationale for producing a core standard is to try and use the word harmonize or simplify um, all this proliferation that is, is going on so that there is something that is easier to, to implement and easier to understand, easier to operationalize and something that's going to about bring about better impact because it's more manageable. I just wondered, I mean, I think we would be interested to find out more about all, all the different standards that are out there. I don't know if, if, if there's a play, is there a, rep there is a report, so that, that would be great if we could, we could have a look at that. And I suppose then the other thing that, um, that I, I, I just slightly uh, wanted to bring up here, um, I've got something from Ed Schenkenberg here, on uh, humanitarian standards. Now, he, 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 may, he may or not be online, but I just read a little article he wrote about humanitarian standards uh, bef before this meeting. And he says, yes, there are a lot of standards, but they all have different purposes and cover specific areas. And so I wondered, if you're having a core standard, are you missing out important things? And how, how do you, you know, wh wh where's the heart of this? And this is an issue that has come up from other people as well. What is, it's Brendan's point, what is, what is at the heart of a core humanitarian standard? Is it technical stuff? Is it values? How, 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 do, we, how do we think about that? Um, well, obviously, one thing I don't want to do is, is to preempt the next stage <laughs> of the project. Mm -hmm. But what, what I can describe um, is, um, and as I, I briefly just did, is what came out of the, the, the joint board and the process over the, over the, over the last months. And, and I'm sure Philip can, can add. add what we see, and this is why standards architecture is very closely tied to um, what the next the, 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 the project will actually now look at. Um, so we see within the centre of, of the new architecture, or it's, it's pulling together existing architecture, humanitarian principles, which we say cannot be moved, and it's right at the centre of what we do. Around that will be, um, so if you see it as three circles, um, around that will be the core standard, and then the outer ring will be technical standards. Now, the core standard, and what we've already started to look at, is where is there overlap between the three organizations already. So to pick up on one, one will clearly, we imagine, be around training and, and to ensure of, of capacity and ability of staff. So that's one that there is, there is already overlap. And then we will look across the other, um, across the other three initiatives to see where there is overlap. What we would hope is that as we move this process forward, that that core standard will become the core standard for Sphere, People in Aid and HAP. So when you open the HAP standard um, and benchmarks, you will see the joint standards at the beginning as and the same for the other three. So that's, and that will be a major shift. But what you will also see as practitioners where the overlap has occurred, it will be nothing new, but a bringing together and a harnessing of those, those three initiatives. Matthew, thank you. Mm. Philip. Uh, thanks, uh, John. Um, well, lots of great comments, um, and, and I'm not sure where to begin. Maybe just to, to, to clarify that we are looking at outside of the humanitarian sector because there's such a rich body of, of knowledge and experience there that we should draw on. And perhaps what to say from looking at others, um, you know, obviously the medical profession is one that's used quite frequently, but if you look on almost any other um, um, industry or sector, where there's kind of standards and certification, this kind of inevitable process happens where uh, there is a bit of what you might call prolif proliferation, and that's normal. It's part of the maturity as you, you get more into detail about the types of things you're doing, and you find a need for more precise uh, guidance and instruction. But what's also normal in a kind of evolutionary process is that you have some harmonization uh, that goes on that allows you to kind of communicate with a common language between you know, one technical, very specific technical scan standard and another. So there's a way of having a, a good engagement about that. Um, so yeah, I've heard the same conversations too over 20 years and it's a bit frustrating, but I do actually think that we are closer today uh, at, to, at kind of achieving that greater coherence and harmonization um, as, as, as uh, any other time in our kind of history. A couple of other um, comments. Mm, you know, you know, there's a lot of skepticism around donors driving this or not, and part of our stakeholder analysis and mapping is uh, what are donors doing? And you know, do they want this or not? I have to say, and, and I'm a skeptic because of my 
previous job measuring and assessing donors against good humanitarian donorship principles. Um, I don't think it's the donors' humanitarian departments. Um, I think they're actually quite supportive of the idea, and they would like to see greater coherence, both in standards and potentially around certification. Where our problem is as a sector is the people who tell those people what to do. And it's part of our education responsibility um, and, and where the potential of kind of harmonization of standards and, and certification is to be able to say, look, we have these things in place because they work, because they allow us to do our job more effectively, to be more accountable. Um, and that's why you shouldn't preference or give preference to, say, private sec sector contractors over humanitarian organizations. And a couple of other um, points around that as well. Absolutely agree that other parts of the sec system should be, to a certain extent, um, held accountable. And maybe it is time for donors, for example, to do a GHD, a good humanitarian donorship type of, of certification. That's really a challenging uh, act to do. It's also going to be challenging to get the UN agencies with all their political clout and, and, and resources to try to act more responsibly. But let's not give that up as a longer term conversation to have with those as well. But let's try to get at least this part of the, the conversation happening about how we get better coherence. Um, and then kind of finally, a couple of comments around you know, what, what becomes the core of either certification or standards. And I think what the consensus is saying is that you know, technical standards are great. They're important to have. But let's not get lost in the bureaucratization of that. Just as we would expect in the social sector or the health sector, you don't want people to just say, this is how many milligrams of a medica medication you have without knowing who you are and having a relationship with you. So let's focus on the values and the relationships, the things that we think make us um, unique uh, and distinctive as humanitarians. Uh, and I would hope that certification would be looking uh, at not bureaucratization, but looking at how do you assess the nature and the quality of the relationship of an organization with its primary stakeholders, the organization or the people that we're trying to, to support. Um, and that and the context that we work in. So inevitably has to be flexible. I don't think it's a yes or no, you applied uh, the sphere technical standards on water and sanitation uh, so much as did the organization make every effort possible to meet the needs of the affected population? And that's, I think, what should be the types of questions we should be looking at. Affected communities, and we keep saying this, this is at the core of it. I actually think that the dynamics, as Matthew was saying, uh, around who and the, the nature of humanitarian work and organizations is changing. Well, there's a lot more Southern actors, and every single day there's more and more capacity at the South. But every single day, there's more and more capacity of affected communities themselves to articulate their concerns and their demands and their expectations of humanitarians. And it's not just because we have technology. That's always been a false excuse to say why we haven't communicated and, and engaged with them. Uh, it's partly because they're becoming more aware uh, of, of their rights and, uh, and more um, demanding of, of what they expect from us. Is that possible to incorporate that into any kind of measurement system and reporting system? Yes, I do think it is possible. I don't know exactly how to do it, but it is possible to do it, um, both methodologically and, and technically. And, but, but to be realistic, I mean, communities, let's not put them on pedestals and assume that everyone's um, uh, innocent and there's no um, inequities and, um, and problems with the communities that we work with. But there are ways, I think, of, of finding uh, ways to systematically gather information from affected communities that will give us feedback about how we're performing, how we're meeting quality from their perspective, not because it's quality as defined by a particular uh, technical um, kind of, of standard. And the final thing is uh, that the language matters. Whenever we're talking about humanitarian principles and accountability, we're using jargon from our sector. And it just keeps us sometimes so much farther away from the spirit of what we are trying to accomplish. So we say impartiality, but when you talk to communities, it probably means 
I got fair treatment. I got an honest treatment. They wouldn't use accountability or partiality as the way to describe that. So we have to be conscious about finding language that's more open and, inc and inclusive if we want to make the design of the next generation of standards and, and certification kind of open and flexible and, and inclusive. We have to be really conscious about that, but that's a decision that we can make now as we look forward about how we're going to design and how we're going to grapple with these issues. They're all issues that we have to, to grapple with, absolutely. Um, but let's not uh, assume from the start that, that we have to um, fail. There's a lot of opportunities here. Philip, thank you. I, I'm going to go out to the, the floor again, if, if I may, um, to get uh, two or three more questions. Uh, you can comment on, on anything you've heard. or, um, Sir, please, with your hand up at the back. Thank you. Oh, just can you say who you are, please? So I can't. I'm Charlie Darren Paul. Oh, hello, Charlie. I didn't oh, John, you, you had a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to. Um, just a couple of quick questions. One about the SCHR review, and I didn't want to ask a silly question, so I tried to look it up on your website a few moments ago on my phone. Um, and there's a 52 or 51 word sentence that I didn't quite understand, so I'm just going to ask it anyway. And that is, is the purpose of the review to determine whether certification is the right thing for the humanitarian sector, or is the purpose of the review to determine which is the best certification model for the humanitarian sector? And then my second question is, and I know we don't want to preempt anything, but I wonder if any of the panel have thoughts about who will be doing the certifying? Because I think in the, in the question that Sandrine asked about keeping affected populations at the heart of what we do, that, that's, that's a really key question. I think we need to be thinking about it. I think they're two fundamentally important uh, qu questions. We'll have to come back to you on that, Philip. Uh, not at this precise second, but uh, I'll give you a few minutes to think about them. Please. Hi, I'm Laura Jump from GHA, um, part of Development Initiatives. I'm going to be a bit cheeky and ask a couple of questions. Um, firstly, how does this all link with some of the other initiatives that are going on at the moment? And my concern there really is that there's a lot of initiatives going on. We've heard about the World um, Humanitarian Summit, which is going to be in 2015. You've got JSI already happening. Um, you've got post-2015. I can go on and on. How is this all going to come together? Um, because once we've got past the philosophy of whether we agree this is good or not, actually implementation is going to depend on um, agencies all coming together and, and implementing together. And that kind of links to my second part, which is um, it's a bit of a shame that we don't have a smaller NGO or a sudden NGO on, on the panel, because one question I have is, how much is this going to cost for the NGOs themselves? And going back to what Sandrine said about um, keeping people out, um, and new NGOs, we want to make sure that somehow that doesn't happen. Um, and then my final point was, um, Philip, you talked about access to more funding as one of the benefits. I'm really interested to hear where that's going to come from and who's that going for. Does that mean that funding is pulled to a smaller group or does that mean that actually more people are going to want to put, um, to give money to the humanitarian sector? And I think that's a very, very key question that we haven't quite opened up yet. Thank you. Laura, thank you. You said you were going to be cheeky and ask two. You slipped in three there. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> Please. Annie. Thank you. Annie Devonport from the DC uh, currently. But actually, I'm sort of thinking back to uh, a previous life and a, and a previous century when I was working uh, in the health service uh, um, as a, uh, a nurse manager. And of course, standards were very much part of what what drove, uh, drove improvement, and I would argue that they, it really did drive improvement, mm. but it wasn't just the setting of those standards and, and making sure people signed up to and knew those standards. It was actually auditing those standards because that enabled us to see how far we were meeting them and how far we weren't, and, and what we needed to do then came out of that so that an action plan would be developed to, to try to meet it. Mm -hmm. So a standard mm -hmm. wasn't, I mean, a standard might be 100% of X. <coughs> we knew mm -hmm. we wouldn't be there. That didn't matter. Uh, we would always strive to improve. But it was the auditing and the working through that process that actually made mm -hmm. a difference. Yeah. And I haven't heard anything about that at, at this point. And I, and I haven't mm -hmm. actually 
in in this in this in the humanitarian since I've been in the humanitarian world. Mm. So comments. Annie, thank you. We'll take one more from the gentleman in the front row there. Uh, my name is Maxwell, uh, independent. I have three questions, but I'll ask two. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first <laughs> question is, what will be the likely impact of, of certification on the security of humanitarian workers and adherence to humanitarian principles, particularly in conflict areas? The second question is, who will be certified? Not by who, but who. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that's, you're not the first person to ask that, that one, so we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Philip on that one. I just wanted to pick up on the, um, on the online questions that are coming in. We have some, uh, a question from uh, Barb Wigley um, from the World Food Programme in Rome, and she says, uh, as everyone agrees with certification, and that's certainly the case around this panel here, um, no, and no. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so Did sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking standards, not certification. And she says, and the HAP certification scheme doesn't seem to be the answer, or at least the complete answer. What's been learnt about HAP that will inform the development of something new? Um, Julian Shrodeski from World Vision says, how does all this standards and certification fit with the coordination role that UN clusters? and working groups play, which is a, an important one. And then Mukesh Kumar from Mishra from UNESCO very happily says, thanks for all of this. How can I support HAP certification scheme in our community? So <laughs> that's, that's very nice. I think we'll take these questions. I mean, um, I mean, not that I want to uh, be too directive about this, but Charlie's questions quite important, I thought, Philip, about the fundamental purpose for what you're doing. Um, and maybe we can come to that. But also to, to open up uh, this side of the, the panel as well to, um, to, to respond to anything you've heard. So maybe we could start over here. And I'll, I'll probably finish with you, if that's okay. Yep. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Yeah. Well, then I have the microphone and I mm. take the chance, <laughs> since I have it. Um, the question that came about the links to the mm. 2015, um, post 2015, post Hugo and so on um, agenda and other initiatives out there gives me a bit of space to say a little bit more general things. So I'm jumping on that one first. Um, I think we're currently struggling to get disaster response preparedness into that framework. And why is that so important? And why does it relate to this discussion? I think one of the main trends, certainly it is the main piece of analysis that influences Oxfam in its design of its humanitarian strategy for the next years is that we are seeing that with the rise in numbers of natural disasters and the rise of number of people affected by disasters and the slower growth of the capacity of the humanitarian enterprise, we have what we are describing as a growing humanitarian service gap. That's only partially balanced by some governments and some middle-income countries who are really ramping up their response capacity. But overall, we basically have more people affected by disasters that don't get the services they're entitled to. And it's obvious that us elitarian club, clubs of uh, predominantly Western organizations by just doing a little bit more, just building a bit more capacity, just doing it a little bit better and having a few more standards are not turning the tide. That's not making the difference. So it is really making the difference in the most vulnerable countries, in the countries that are most disaster affected, where they have the most number of vulnerable people who are potentially affected by disasters. And there's a direct link between poverty and the way people are affected of disasters because they have less coping mechanisms and so on and so forth. So that is the big picture that is rather obvious. Now, if you want to work on that level, if you want to build local national civil society capacity and national government capacities, then you need to clearly define on what capacities you are trying to build, to which standards, what you expect, and so on and so forth. So this is not just a discussion about us. This is about a discussion how we reach out and turn that tight. Yes, we have to change, and something in the way we're working has to change. It's less about us. It's more about enabling and capacitating and empowering others to be more effective. In that regard, Oxfam, for example, has now said, well, in the past, we always looked at governments and said, well, they have to do it. 
now we're actually saying, no, obviously there are quite a few governments who are willing, yeah, there are some that are unwilling, um, some who are willing but not yet capable, and we will invest as an NGO, we will invest in helping those governments to build their local capacity to deal with responses better. And we <laughs> will build national partners' capacities and other forms of civil society and put more resources behind it, rather than just investing in us and saying, well, we're going to hire another 10 you know, support personnel that we can parachute into the next disaster, and then another 10, and we're going to train them, and we send them to another course. Yes, we will continue doing that. That's not the answer. The answer is right there. And the link is we are kind of like trying to role model what kind of humanitarian work constitutes high quality humanitarian work as it's uh, ourselves, and we need to link that by influencing processes like the post 2015 agendas to say well this is what we want to see from you governments doing setting the legal frameworks rather than stifling civil society open up the space for them to be able to operate you rather than being obstructive being willing to engage with us in a dialogue on what helps the people the most and being open to be held to account by your own civil society in your country for the services that you're legally obliged to deliver. And that's why I see the link. And that's why I brought in that framework. Thank you. Uh, right. Um, oh, so many interesting questions. Um, I would just, I guess, I mean, I, I, I go back to the, the the original uh, starting off point that I had, which was that, you know, the way we see humanitarian action is, is really not only about relief, um, even though many governments, including donor governments, would like to reduce it to that. So we have to be sure not to lose the bigger picture about what's happening to people uh, and, and not become obsessed with the, 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 the mechanics of providing aid. And I think, I mean, but that doesn't preclude, y you know, your point, I think, on, on auditing. And, you know, we really believe that we're not, uh, that every uh, organization has to take its own responsibility and develop its own uh, standards and also learn and adapt to the different context. Uh, you know, I think, for example, you know, standards sh should be based on practice. Uh, and, and, for example, now we're, we're getting more and more challenges about working in middle-income countries, uh, you know, and the Syria crisis is going to be a bit real test for that. Sphere standards look kind of laughable uh, compared to uh, a lot of the normal living standards in places like Lebanon, or mm. or, or Turkey, or or Jordan. Um, so that's that's a real kind of reality check on that side. Um, but then um, I also wanted to to make a note about the point Maxwell was making on. Uh, the implications for security. What uh, would, what impact would uh, certification have on security? Um, well, we think actually that one of the problems with the the certification is that actually it ends up um, being that these the organisations that are certified they will inevitably, and I will argue till the cows come home with Philip on this, um, that it is a donor led secretly or overtly or covertly. <laughs> it's a donor led <laughs> process, let's not kid ourselves. And the donors will favor those that are certified. And they will be, as, as you know, that many NGOs are accused of being a Trojan horse for donor interests. So this will be uh, somehow the proof of the pudding, you know, because there are quite a few donors that have not signed up to the Good Humanitarian Donorship Accord. And if you look at the Busan uh, meeting, you know, China, Brazil, India, they said, oh, by the way, we're not going to sign up to that. We have our own, you know, way of doing things. So uh, I, I think certification will end up being the reduct of those, you know, uh, European uh, government's uh, favorite organizations. And I think that's a, that's a so I'm linking that right, right back to the security <laughs> issue because I frankly think those guys will not be on the ground in a conflict situation. And, and we're seeing that already. I mean, I, I know you're talking about a kind of, you know, the Malaysias and the Indonesias. I'm talking about Central African Republic, right? I mean, talk about building partner, partners and uh, host government capacity. It's a massive challenge in Central African Republic, and power is being contested all the time at local level, at a, a, a larger level as well. So we, ha we, we, we have to, you know, 
I just urge everyone every now and then just to think about Central African Republic when you're, <laughs> when you're thinking about these processes because it's really, um, again, you know, I, I, I go back to, uh, sorry to repeat my point, but it's very much, we see this as a, a, a needing to be flexible and responsive and not overly bureaucratic and overly process oriented. Thanks. I'm, I'll just make a few comments to what, what various people have said. Um, Morris and Brendan and, and Addy and others raised the issue of comparative sectors. And I've been working a little bit with the mining sector in the last couple of years. And I think it's, you know, I don't know this for certain, but I think it's probably likely that they have many more than 100 frameworks of standards, actually. And I think it would be very interesting to have a meeting or two with them about what they do. And I mean, I'm just thinking of what I, what I know. They've got complicated standards on environmental protection, obviously. They've got standards on safety, which just, you know, are an obsession in the sector, quite rightly. Um, they've got standards on how you dig and what technology you use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then they've got all their social standards around um, community relations and complex, you know, IFC-based standards on resettling communities, if you have to, et cetera. They've got very detailed sec standards on closure, mine closure, huge standards on how you should exit and close a mine properly, all these things that we probably have to. Um, and of course now human rights and things. So I think there is a, a lot that could be gained probably from an in informal discussion with ICMM, the International Council of Mining and Minerals, who, who are their cartel, or whatever you like to call it, of the, of the big guys that Sandrine is rightly worried about, the, 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 the big group. But th there would be a lot there that you'd probably find in common. Um, I think it brings brings it to my next point that um, Laura raised from, from GHA about you know, how do we bring all this together and I'm not sure you do bring it all together in international relations. <laughs> I mean I think one of the problems we face theoretically is that we, we often treat international relations as if it's domestic relations. And so when we have policy and initiatives and agendas like post 12 2015 and MGGs and World Humanitarian Summit, we tend to assume that it'll be like a sophisticated, you know, democracy where there will be something called a ministry to bring it together and then roll it out and implement it. But that doesn't exist in international relations. So, you know, I think we have to, to realize that, um, you know, a bit like Morris pointed out at the beginning, you know, this is all just happening and going forward because we don't have global government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it is a, a long process of international anarchy at one level. You know, it, where order struggles with <laughs> anarchy and, and changes and emerging powers which are going to change everything. So I'm not sure we do ever bring it all together in that way. Therefore, it's our responsibility as agencies to you know, do as much as we can in-house to create standards and, and live by them. Um, the other thing, you know, Juan in Mexico and Annie here talking about success and measuring success, and I think that's very important that um, anything that you do come up with is able to know and show what's happened. And that's a very useful catchphrase from John Ruggie's <coughs> UN guidelines on business and human rights. You know, you've got to know and show. You've got to know what impact and effect you're having and be able to show it. And I think that's a, a little idiom we should probably introduce into, into our efforts at standard setting and things. Um, and then just on, finally on um, certification. Sandrine's now got me thinking again and <laughs> worrying and I won't be such an, a zealot next time for <laughs> it. Because right? um, I think that is a very important point. Um, and you know, I, so we have to think who, who's going to be certified and who by and whether it's a good thing or playing into a certain political agenda of some kind. Um, my instinct is still that we should be able to say that we are humanitarian agencies and know what that means and have some way of saying, you know, because we sign up for this, that, and the other, or whatever. Um, and then going back to Brendan's original point and, and the point about core standards and others, I think, again, if you, we do have to understand our sector as totally multidisciplinary. So we're always going to have standards in nutrition and health and all these things and logistics and accounting and whatever, like the mining sector does. That's why they have over assume and the you know, food industry or whatever. Um, so it is about capturing what is that core thing and I think that's a great challenge that Matthew's project's got um, of what it really is distinctive about. You know, you may be a nutritionist or um, a driver or whatever but you are 
also in some way a humanitarian one. I was doing some interesting work in Geneva the other day with the Geneva University faculty, which trains interpreters. And they train interpreters for ICRCN, UNHCR, and OCHA. And they wanted to think through what it meant to be a humanitarian interpreter. And it is an interesting question. You, know, you are actually <laughs> having to be impartial, neutral, independent in a way that you, know, you don't always have to be when you're interpreting. So what is that, that extra bit? That's the bit to capture, I think. Thanks. Yes, it rem reminds me of someone who was uh, uh, interpreting for, for Bob, Bob Geldof um, when, he, when he visited Mengistu, and they had a, a very big job on his hands to remain <laughs> diplomatic. Um, Philip, um, I wonder if, very, very quickly, you could, and uh, if, you, if you can be as concise as possible, that's great because we're running out of time, but Charlie's questions were quite, quite sort of basically fundamental, I thought. Can you address them? Yeah, I mean, we don't know the answers to all those, these questions. These are the types of things that we want to find the answers to. Um, you know, the, the question raised over there about, um, you know, if, if certification is going to add value or not, if it, is it going to be too risky um, to jeopardize the independence, the impartiality of humanitarian organizations or not? Our sense is that it is possible. But we want to understand what the conditions are uh, to make it successful. And, uh, and, and, and then to understand what would be the best model to, to do that. So already we've heard a few things about who, who should and maybe who shouldn't do it. And there's no appetite at all within this sector that, for example, the UN be in charge of any certification mm -hmm. process for, for us. And I would be the first to say I don't, uh, wouldn't agree with that. Uh, but, but there are um, examples from outside where you gain legitimacy and credibility by bringing together uh, the right balance of stakeholders, there's the right level of representation and the right level of credibility to come up with some kind of uh, a model that meets your interests as, as a community. And, and I think we can find, um, find that out. Uh, donor driven, I just really have to pick this up again. Uh, the reality is that <laughs> you know, donors are already mani manifesting their influence in so many other ways around the sector. They don't need certification to do that. They will continue to do that through their own processes and procedures if they want to. But let's not lose sight, and GHA has done a good job of this, of that there's other sources of funding out there that are much overwhelmed what OECD DAC donors uh, already give. And by making people a bit more aware of what works and why it works and what constitutes or, or makes humanitarian kind of unique and, and special, we can begin to educate those other funding sources and make them, uh, give them some uh, opportunities to make informed choices. Uh, but it co comes back to providing evidence and this know and show thing that uh, is actually quite important and, and Anna, you mentioned it as well. Uh, we need to build the evidence base for that. We can't just say that we apply standards and that not give any evidence uh, for that. We can't just say that we work with affected communities and then don't systematically sh demonstrate and provide evidence of that. Um, we need to knew, knew that, know, uh, find that evidence, and by having standards and certification, that's one mechanism of being a bit more systematic about how we do it. And the final point, and this actually comes out of other experiences like fair trade, is that once you do achieve a certain level of critical mass, you won't get all the mining industry or all the coffee producers of the world to sign up to some standards about ethical and social res uh, responsible behavior. But by the mere fact that you've got enough working to in this line of travel, you begin to influence behavior throughout the whole sector. And I hope that we can work towards that aim as well, both in terms of how donors, whether they're gar government or not, how um, the public conceives and thinks about what effective, accountable humanitarian action is, and, and what humanitarian organizations, big or small, new or, or, or older, uh, begin to understand what, what that means and what good practice is. Very, very quickly, is there any b a chance uh, a, a DFID representative in the room? Anyone from DFID here? A DFID funding you? A DFID funding you? Um, well, just in answer to the question that mm. I think Laura posed around where is funding coming from, mm. and I think this mm. is really critical for the next stage, it's coming from the three initiatives. Mm. 
Right. So, uh, and that's been fundamental to the next stage. So mm. we are funding it. Mm. Um, in turn, those are funded. So it's about shifting of budgets, etc., mm. which I think is really critical. Yeah. Um, but just, can I just pick up on one point? Matthew, you can have the last word. Not only <laughs> you can pick up on that, but you can finish us off. Thank you. Um, certification, donor-led. I can see the concern, but I think we really need to go back to um, where this whole debate originated 20 years ago. I see John Borton is over in the corner, the joint standards evaluation. This came from about shifting power and about hearing people's voice. And I think this is really, really critical. It's not about donor-driven. I think donors are equally concerned that it will be seen by this. It's about a change. And I think this is what's really exciting about the next initiative. And then just a quick response to Barb, who are, who's been fundamental to the process, fundamental to HAP over the years. She talks about the role of HAP. HAP is working very closely um, with the certification. And the wealth of information it's created over the last 10 years and very much feeding into the next stages of the certification review. Matthew, thank you very much. I, I feel as though we've, we've scratched the surface <laughs> of, the, of, of this debate, this conversation, um, um, but there's, l there's lots more. I mean, I'd really like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank all of the uh, online participants for their questions. I'd like to think, thank the panel very much for their uh, wisdom and experience and uh, general articulation. And, and most of all, I think um, to thank um, Philip and, and Matthew for coming. Um, I mean, I think there's been a lot of support in the room for, for, uh, for both of these processes. And I, I hope very much that the, um, the, the issues and questions that have been raised here are going to be helpful as you move forward, Matthew, in, in, into your next phase, and uh, Philip, as you go forward um, in your consultation and recommendation process. I hope it's also helpful for the, the, um, the meeting in Geneva. And so uh, I'd like to um, give the panel and Matthew and Philip a very uh, strong round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>